can cancer be prevented? And if so, what percent of the time and how? Well, what makes that good question difficult is that we have children who get cancer and the number one cause of death in children besides accidents is acute blastocytic leukemia. And we have, we have teenagers and young people that get brain cancers and their cancers can be traced back to the parents' diet and the mother's diet even before conception. Let me say this right now that the lack of green vegetables in the mother's diet before she gets pregnant, years before she gets pregnant, or the inclusion of luncheon meats like pastrami and bacon could increase her risk of having a child with cancer or a brain tumor later on. So even though we probably can wipe out most cancers, we can't completely win the war on cancer by just changing people's diet who have cancer or changing people's diet midstream. We have to change the diet of the whole population, which includes the diet of children and the diet of pe uh, people who before they have kids, because the eggs that make the future generation are living in the body of the woman while she's going to the fast food restaurants eating junk food. And those eggs could be damaged while there's before she even fertilizes them. So yes, we look at studies around the world and we have that and we have populations that almost have no breast cancer. And breast cancer wasn't even mentioned in the medical literature, you know, until the last hundred years or so. In the 19, in the 16th century, the, the first cancer that was talked about significantly was scrotal cancer found in uh, men who worked in chimney sweeps, you know, who worked in smokestacks. Um, but in any case, the point is, is that when we look at populations eating full primitive diets of variety. We see, we don't see these cancers we see today. Certainly we've, we've in even 1960s, we have populations with 150th, not 115th, but 150th the amount of breast cancer we have in the United States. When those populations move to the United States, they start to get cancer based on what, the way we eat here. But if we're going to truly win the, we have the ability and we have the science to win the war on cancer but it would take a massive change in the way everybody eats, the way they raise their ch children. Because don't forget that when the cell is replicating and growing most rapidly during childhood, it unravels the DNA that's like wound tightly like a golf ball with the rubber band wound in the center of a golf ball. And when you unravel the DNA, expose it, it becomes more potentially damaged to the type of damage that could lead to later life cancer. That's why giving, treating Leukemia in children with cancer causing with, um, with chemotherapeutic agents can and often does lead to later life, increased risk of later life cancers and treating people with autoimmune diseases who have psoriasis and, and, and um, autoimmune conditions like, um, like rheumatoid arthritis and, and Sjogren's syndrome and other types of um, diseases of the skin, lupus, whatever, that, that treating those in, with chemotherapy again increases later life risk of cancer. I think our whole, the whole medical profession management of these illnesses is barbaric because obviously my experience over the last decades is that these people can make complete recoveries without giving them drugs that we know cause cancer. But the younger in life you incur these medications and you take these, you're exposed to poisons, the later the risk of cancer down the road and the cancer, part of that cancer causation occurs decades, many decades before you get cancer. Your childhood diet, what you eat in the first 20 years of your life has an effect on what happens to you when you're 50 or 60 or 70. And that's why... You could say, I'm so um, passionate about advocating people make a full change to such a healthy diet. Why, why am I so strict in the dietary recommendation I'm making it, or so such a degree of perfectionism in how I want people to eat because they've already caused such cellular damage, broken DNA crosslinks, methylation defects. They're, they've already caused such damage to their cells for the first 40, 50 years they've been living. And now a moderate, goodly, good diet is not going to be sufficient to reverse that damage and protect them against later life damage and cancer. So we really have to pull out all the stops and go for nutritional excellence to help the body repair itself and then give people a diet that most people in America were not going to follow. But if we want to win the war on cancer collectively as among society, then we have to see major dietary changes that are in all parts of, in all aspects of the way people eat at every stage of life. And yes, we don't have to get cancer. So is there a way to stop cancer from spreading if you have it and stop it from coming back for people in remission? You know, I'm publishing an article about that right now in the medical literature. I've made a whole list of cases of people who've had severe cancers who've made complete recoveries from them through, my, through the Nutritarian pro, um, Dietary Portfolio approach for cancer. And I have to say, it's sh been shocking to me to, sh to see that even people who have 
cancers and even some advanced cancers were able to make dramatic and complete, and complete recoveries and live so long. So I've, I've been astounded by the benefits that the diet that this program has had for people. Shocking me, you know, which makes me think that you know you don't give up. But but of course, as you can understand that as the disease advances, you, the chance of getting a complete recovery becomes less and less. You wouldn't expect every person with advanced cancer to make recovery because they change their diet. But I've seen a lot of it happen, and I'm not an oncologist, so as a family as a family physician, I don't see that many cancer patients. But the ones I have seen have made such incredible. Um, positive response. Give you an example of a lady who had metastatic ovarian cancer with four liters of fluid taken out of her lung in 1997, given uh, four months, four to six months to live and, um, and is alive today. What is that? 24 years later with no cancer and no, you know, she was supposed to be dead 24 years ago. And another, you know, another person, one of my patients with stage four lymphoma, who I watched the lymphoma shrink right up. They were exposed on the skin. You could feel them in her groin. You could feel them in her body. And she had biopsies and stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that totally went away. And I have the people thriving and another person with testicular cancer. I can keep one example. I another person with metastatic breast cancer who I thought was a goner, you know, who manages to be alive 15 years later and have no reoccurrences. So obviously we don't have the vast number of people with any one type of dietary protocol to have any significant proof, but using these clinical case histories, I'm still going to be publishing a lot of these and putting them out there to show people the possibilities that exist. And why not do something as har- that's so good for you and harmless and is not going to kill you as like chemotherapy will. And the facts are, is chemotherapy doesn't work very well for most cancers. The pro- like later life prostate and breast cancer are too slowly growing. They're not growing fast enough for the DNA to be exposed enough to be damaged by the chemo too badly. And the chemo doesn't have much effect at extending lifespan for later life estrogen positive um, breast cancer and later life um, prostate cancers. So people are much better off. And we do have a lot of people with um, postmenopausal and prostate breast cancer and prostate cancer who we could measure the re- reduction of, you know, see the PSA going down and see, the, see how well people are doing with this approach. So obviously there's no promises that it works for everybody, but of course there's so many people that have done super well utilizing this, these dietary concepts and doing fantastic. Why was it important for you to come speak at the Real Truth About Health conference? Well, you know, I like the idea. I think it's a great idea to reach so many individuals. There's such a a broad outreach of people. And I've gotten so much feedback of of gratitude for being part of it and for being a, a, a source of common sense and logic and, you know, and science so they can really help people weed through all the mixed messaging they get, they get. And I think that's something really good about this conference is because people can get a a lot of information and then they can see if what they're hearing really meshes together in a way to make a, you know, to make a lot good logic and good science. And so many people are misled in the wrong direction and you can't let your favored guru and disbelieve what people say, you know, because you can pick what, you know, people, it's just, you got to really look for evidence. It's the same thing in the political arena today. You got to look for evidence and overwhelming amount of logic and science and try to be careful in your decisions and not make mistakes. And with a body, we only get one body. We don't get a new one. We lose this one and destroy it. We don't get a free ride. We try to take care of the one vehicle we've given. And we got to, and I'm ending here with, we got to take care of the vehicle we're given of this earth, the planet we're on too. Only if we take care of this, this ship that we're given, can we thrive and have our generations ahead of us and our children, grandchildren and, and future generations thrive and be healthy? We have to keep, so it all meshes together in a way, personal health, obviously, protect, you know, doing the right, making the right decisions and being, having goodwill for other people and having goodwill for our planet and for future generations as well. And, I'm, and I think I'm glad to be part of this conference for those um, obviously good efforts being made. Well, we certainly appreciate that. And we, we appreciate that you're a part of it uh, year in and year out. It, it means a lot to us and, of course, to our audiences uh, who you're benefiting. So thank you for, for everything and for joining us today. And with that, we, we wish you the very best. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Dr. Fairman. Take care. Bye-bye. Be well. <laughs>